Can I make a confession to you all this morning? I'm madly in love with Jesus Christ. Amen? I don't just know of Him. I know Him. And I want you to know Him more as well. Because I can't get enough of Him. He's all that in a bag of chips. Amen? Would you open your Bibles with me? To, and we're going to start with Matthew 21. I'm going to teach you a message, or pre preach a message, teach a message, I hope as much, that I'm simply going to entitle, The Week That Changed the World. It is the introduction of this, these historical events in the Scripture that outline the pathway God would take with mankind for the rest of their time on earth. The culmination of a series of prophetic events fulfilled in the scripture that you're about to read are indicative of God's great love for us based on His will for us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? This is a holy day for a reason. This is a day of reverence. This is a day of honor. This is a day of remembrance at what happened here because of its importance and what would happen one week from today. Amen? Read with me, please, chapter 21 and verse 1. When you all there say amen. And when they were drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and they were come to Bethphage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, Behold, thy king hath come unto thee, meek and lowly, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the fall of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and they brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes and set them thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and the multitudes that followed cried, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And they were, they were come unto Jerusalem. All the city was moved, saying, Who is this? Would you pray with me, Father, in the name of Jesus, as we come before your presence to glean from your word, we are reminded of these events that are outlined and transpire in all of the Gospels as a message to the world of what was about to transpire concerning the condition of the souls of mankind. We pray that this word is taught and led by your spirit. We pray it is received with gladness and joy unspeakable and full of glory. As your people glean from your word, Lord God, for the issues that are in their life, and for the things that are going on in their life, we simply ask that you begin to impart hope and courage through this promise of your word to all of us that remain to this day. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. The part that was omitted from the scripture in this particular passage has a lot to do with who we are. Because when they were shouting in the Hebrew tongue, Baruch Haba Bashem Adonai, Baruch Haba Bashem Adonai, that is, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Baruch Haba Yashem Adonai. The celebration caused the religious figureheads and the leaders of both the Roman Empire and the Jewish Sanhedrin to curse this praise and worship for what it was. And they came to Jesus and they said, make your disciples and make these people stop doing it. And Jesus said, if they, shout, if they will not shout unto me, even the rocks and the stones will cry out unto me. When we talk about worship and we talk about commitment and praise and giving of yourselves in this to the Lord your God, you see the greatest example of that transpiring in the scriptures as the, the prophecy is fulfilled. This is one of the events that's mentioned in all four of the Gospel writers. The three synoptic Gospels and the Gospel of John all make mention of this event because of its prophetic significance in the Old Testament. You have to understand that from the book of Genesis in 315 
through Genesis 49, verses 10 and 11. The people had been expecting a king to come in to the streets of the city of Jerusalem through the eastern gate and set up his shop and rule and reign on this earth for centuries upon centuries, and now it was being fulfilled. It was just not the way the people wanted, but it was the way that it had to be. God sets forth things the way he sees fit for the betterment of us, which we see after it's all said and done. The example of Jesus coming in to Jerusalem on a donkey as his people worshipped him is no small thing in the annals of prophetic significance in the Old Testament, but it is a fulfillment of several major prophecies as the Jewish people and or the Hebraic people anticipated the coming of the Messiah that would deliver them from the Roman cruelty. The coming of Jesus was intended that all mankind would be liberated from their sin. But the people of the time in the Gospels only thought it was to liberate them from the Roman Empire. Aren't you glad he came for more than just the Jews? He came for you. That's why it's in all the books and that's why it's celebrated this day. This event, this triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem, to the, to the naked eye and to the reader would represent the Jewish deliverance from the Roman Empire but rightly understood it was God's perfect timing for the deliverance of all mankind that anyone from this point forward that takes the name of Jesus Christ will not be damned to hell any longer that they not will be go to heaven or hell simply by the fact of whether they were Jews or Gentiles but that God would pour himself upon all of this earth and the blood that would cover the son of his, his blood the blood of his son Jesus Christ would cover the sins of all mankind but he had to get in there first before he could do it. He would not leave the city of Jerusalem the same way he came in. He would leave far different. And you should understand that Jesus Christ today is far different than the Jesus Christ that took himself on the cross. He put himself on the cross, but I can assure you that he's not on that cross any longer. In the book of Matthew, he's the Lamb of God led to the slaughter. But in the book of Revelation, he is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen? He's not that guy. He's that guy, but he's not that guy there. He's different now. He's resurrected now. Amen? In the gospel, he wears a crown of thorns. But in the book of Revelation, he wears crown upon crown upon crown upon crown. For he is king of kings and lord of lords. In the gospels, he comes into Jerusalem on a donkey. But in the book of Revelation, he sits on a horse. And his eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and in righteousness he doth judge war, he judges and makes war, and he treadeth the fierceness of the winepress of the wrath of Almighty God to a fallen world and the God of this world. Rome could not kill him, the grave could not hold him, the cross could not condemn him. He is the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. He's the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the fairest of ten thousand, the lily of the valley the bright and morning star he who's called wonderful counselor mighty God the everlasting father and the prince of peace he is the balm of Gilead he is the rose of Sharon he is the lord of lords he is the god of gods he is the lion of the tribe of Judah and he's the light of the world somebody give God some praise on this Palm Sunday in the Gospels, he dragged before Pilate and Herod. But in the book of Revelation, Pilate and Herod will be dragged before him, as well as Hitler and Mussolini and Ben Laden and all who've committed genocide against the innocent in this earth. He will exact his vengeance and he will exact his judgment upon a people that have abused the people of the innocent of this world. He will, he will redeem your soul from your sins and he will be in fellowship with him forever and forevermore. That's the promise of this word manifested before your eyes in the scripture. When he came into the city of Jerusalem, all of these things were enacted to the betterment and to the glory of God over all the evil that is this world. We come to the last week of Jesus Christ in his earthly time on earth. He is on his way to Jerusalem to pre present himself as the Passover lamb. He knew what was coming. The city of Jerusalem is abuzz with the people pouring in to celebrate the Passover festival, celebrating God's deliverance of the Hebrews from their bondage. Notice the parallels here of the Passover and the crucifixion. 
The deliverance of the Hebrews was the Passover. The deliverance of the souls of men is in the crucifixion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's why we celebrate that, and that's why we remember that, and that's why we come here on Palm Sunday to give thanks unto God for it. Up until this time, Jesus had walked this earth in a relatively low profile, but as the streets were fulfilled with the multitudes and the masses of people from all of Palestine, Jesus, now sensing his destiny, introduces himself to the world and comes to the center of everything and allows his disciples to declare, declare him the Messiah. Everything now is ready for the redemption of the souls of men. First of all, we can't do this without underscoring the prophetic significance of the event. In Genesis 49 and 10, and in other scriptures which I'll give you, it talks about the king coming through the city gates and the anticipation of the one that would deliver all of Israel from its bondage and all of its Israel from its ministry, misery, and restore it as a nation and bring to the promises of God together. In Genesis 49, verses 10 and 11, the Bible says, The scepter shall not depart from Jerusalem, nor a lawgiver from beneath his feet, until Shiloh comes, and unto him shall be a gathering of the people be. Binding his fall into the vine and the ashes called unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. The word Shiloh means rest giver or peace bringer. When someone comes to Christ, they find rest for their weary souls and peace to live life in victory and dominion over all the power of the enemy. In Psalm 24, verses 7 and 10, declares the entrance of the Lord when it says, Lift up ye gates. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? It is the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? It is the Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. In Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26, the Bible says, Save now, I beseech thee. O Lord, O Lord, I beseech Teach thee and send prosperity. Be he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of God. In Isaiah 62, 10 and 11, the scripture says, Go through, go through the gates, prepare ye the way of the people, cast up, cast up the highway, gathereth out of the stones, lift a standard for the people. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, say ye to the daughter of Zion, behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. In Zechariah 9, verse 9, the Bible says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, having salvation lonely and riding upon an ass and upon a colt of the foal of an ass. This incredible timeline is outlined in the book of Daniel, written 575 years before the time he would actually do it, and fulfilled a Zacharian prophecy along the same time. But the shocking moment, the shocking thing is it is dated to the exact day from the book of Daniel that he would come to the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Five centuries before it happened, Daniel prophesied the exact date, 173,800 and 80 days later, which was prophesied according to the dissimulation of the math at the time, Jesus Christ fulfilled that prophecy to the jot and tittle when he climbed on that donkey and he rode to his demise uh, into the streets of Jerusalem as the same people who were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. One week later, will be or what, a few days later, will be crying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. The same that followed him would abandon him. The disciples he trusted left him but God was with our glorious Lord and Savior and he was with him to the cross and now because of the cross of Calvary he sits down at the right hand of the Father in power and majesty and glory your Savior your Lord your Redeemer your strength your shield your buckler your high tower your strength in every situation and because of that, he hath placed the spirit of his son into your hearts, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The command to restore Jerusalem was given by Artaxerxes, you might remember him, from the book of Esther. Artaxerxes, Longimanus, on March 15th, 455 B.C., which the account is given in Nehemiah 2, verses 1 and 8. Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem on exactly that day after Xerxes ordered to restore. 
In Daniel 9, 26, the prophecy reads, After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, and not for himself. And the people of the prince, they shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And in the end of the war, desolations are determined. After entering Jerusalem, Jesus wept for the city because it did not realize that he was there all along. Jesus was crucified less than a week after entering Jerusalem. Emperor Titus, under the Roman garrison in A.D. 70, would besiege the temple in Jerusalem and destroy it until it's re rebuilt in the book of Revelation, as Daniel had predicted. Validating this event in the New Testament are four gospel writers. Number one is Matthew. The ex-tax collector documents the event in Matthew 21 and 2. John Mark, a young man who sat at the feet of Simon Peter and the Apostle Paul, recorded it in Mark 11. The physician Luke recorded it in Luke 19.30. And the beloved Apostle John tied the happenings to prophecy in John 12, 2 and 15. He witnessed the following event firsthand. On Friday, Nisan the 8th, A.D. 1, the arrival into Bethany to spend time with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. In John 12, verse 1, Jesus arrived in Bethany six days before the Passover to spend some time with his friends Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. While he was there, that was when Mary anointed his feet with costly perfume as an act of humility. This tender expression indicated Mary's devotion to Jesus, Jesus and willing to serve him and understood that his hour on this earth was near and she was seeking mercy from God by giving everything she had to God. The story recounts as a testimony of her love and devotion to this day. On Saturday, Nisan the 9th, excuse me, on Saturday, Nisan the 9th is a Sabbath day, and on the Sabbath day there is rest and nobody does anything. On Sunday, Nisan 10th, that would be today, right about now, as the sun comes over and rises on the east, it's, he comes in. The reason it does is because all kings come at this hour and enter into the eastern gate of a city. It's a whole lot harder to kill somebody when you're shooting at them with the sun in them. Amen, Walls. If you want to assassinate somebody, high noon is not the time to do it. Why? Because if you're looking in the sun, you can't see anything when you're looking directly in the sun. Have you ever tried to do anything looking directly in the sun, including drive? If it's hard enough to drive when the sun is at its highest point, don't you think it would be hard to shoot or stab or kill something if it's doing the same way? So there was a logic to behind the doing it. All kings and monarchs enter the eastern gate of a city or eastern part of a building. It's tradition that royalty and monarchy do that according to the laws and to the history of, their, of a monarchy. So Jesus, And when Jesus comes back, he's going to come back in the eastern gate of the city of Jerusalem. Well, you say, well, pastor, that's walled up. Let me tell you something. A walled gate is not going to stop Jerusalem or Jesus from coming back into Jerusalem through the eastern gate. Hardly will it stop him. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. He will get through the eastern gate whether it's concreted or not. Amen? And let me tell you something. There's a whole lot of artifacts in Jerusalem that say Jesus is not the Son of God. The Dome of the Rock, which sits in Jerusalem, is spelled in Arabic. God has no son. God has no son. God has no son. Well, I submit to you that in this church in America, God not only has a son, but he has a son that's going to come into that dome, and he's going to set up his throne there, and he's going to rule and reign there when he comes back to this earth, and he's going to bring you and me with him. In Mark 11, verses 7 through 11, the scripture says, And they brought the colt unto Jesus, and cast their garments upon him. And they spread their garments in the way, and upon the down branches of the trees, and strawed them along the way. And they that went before, and they that followed, cried, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple when he had hooked around all things. And when evening time had come, he went went with the twelve. On Monday, Nisan 11th, is the clearing of the temple. That's when the corruptible money changers that presided in the temple, exacting unbalanced weights for the trade they performed, were cast out, and God's house was once again made a house of prayer. This is not a house of commerce. This is a house of prayer. 
We take your money to advance the kingdom of God. We are not commercialists. We are not marketers. We are not networkers. We come here because Jesus Christ is the Lord of our church. And when the, prayer, when the house of God stops being a house of prayer first, then the house of God will cease to exist as we know it. Yes, commerce is part of the Christian faith. We must take care of our bills and be responsible stewards. But our hearts and our motivation goes to Jesus Christ and his message of this cross to the entire world. That is the centerpiece of who we are and it always will be. When we take Christ out of everything we do and we replace it with something else, we are playing and exacting a fool's game. And we have etched across our heads the name Ichabod, which means the glory of God has left the house of God. We must always keep the message and the purpose of who we are first in everything that we do for the tremendous price that was paid for us. On Monday, Nisan 11th, there's the clearing of the temple outlined in Mark 11 and 12. He took away all of the corruptible expenditures that transformed inspired in a church and he demanded that his people make his house a house of prayer first and foremost and when prayer comes back to the centerpiece of what we do then the house of God will prosper beyond anyone's knowledge because that's been the centerpiece all along as it was intended he wanted this to be a house of prayer on Tuesday it was a day of teaching in the temple, Nisan 12. It was a day of controversy, and it was a day of parables. They are outlined in Matthew 21 through 24 and 51. They are outlined in Mark 11 through 13, 37. And they are introduced in Luke 20, verses 21 through 36. Jesus spends an eventful day in Jerusalem that permeates with the invasion, the evasion of the traps of the Pharisees, and then he goes up to the Mount of Olives, and he teaches in parables and warns them of the leaven of the Pharisees. He predicts the destruction of Herod's temple and tells his disciples about future events, eliminating excuse me, a future eliminate, culminating in his return to earth. During this one week period, Jesus would do the following things. He would have six teaching lessons. Highlighted in these discourses would be 31 parables. Confirming these discourses would be nine miracles. On Wednesday, Nisan 13th, A.D. 1, it was a day of rest. According to the timelines in the book of Mark and John, an accounting of days while the gospel records nothing, nor is there any historical account of it, this appears to be a day of rest and preparation for the events that would transpire on the next day. On Nisan 14th, the Passover and the Last Supper is described in Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 27, and John 30 begin to transpire as Jesus breaks bread in communion with his disciples, and he begins to teach them about the impartation of the Holy Spirit. Judas is run off. He goes off and gets his money to betray Jesus. And after they had sang songs, they went out into the Garden of Gethsemane. And they were praying as Jesus said, Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, thy will, but my, your will, my will, but your will be done. And after that, Judas shows up with a Roman garrison. And he's betrayed and brought to the Roman Sanhedrin. And he's illegally illegally sentenced in Jewish law, but they did it anyways on the Passover. The next morning he is brought before Pilate, and the judgment of Pilate was that he was innocent, but they crucified him anyways. They beat him unmercifully until he barely had the assemblance of a man. He didn't even look like a human being on the cross that he took so much. No other man could have survived that kind of beating and got up on the cross but Jesus Christ. He would bled everywhere, and when the blood hit the cobblestone streets of the city of Jerusalem, you're redemption was assured and your redemption was born in that blood he hung on the cross from three to, from six in the morning till three in the afternoon the skies were dark as God God cried out of the clouds the sorrow he felt for the son that he had to put there in the first place predetermined nevertheless just as heartbreaking as it ever was no one wants to see their son go through anything in life like that how much more would God now want to see his precious sinless lamb of God endure the betrayal of those who do who he, the very people that he was sent to save in the first place hallelujah he loved you that much but there's a Sunday coming next week. The reason that we worship on Sunday, the Lord's Day, is because it's the day that he showed himself alive. All that came before us are in the grave. Mohammed's in a grave in Medina. In Shanghai, China, 
Confucius is in a grave. Buddha's in a grave in India. Joseph Smith's in a grave in Pennsylvania. Mary Baker Eddy and L. Ron Hubbard, the heroes and the gods of this world, all have this one thing in common. They are buried and there's a body, and they can go, if they open that grave, they'll find the body of their god. But on a street... On a street in Jerusalem. Come on, wake up. On a street in Jerusalem, in the heart of Jerusalem, there is a grave of Joseph of Arimathea. And that grave has the stone rolled out. And a sign, and a sign that says he's not here. He's not here. He's not here. He's risen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. He's not a religious metaphor. He's not some sort of symbol. He's not anything made out of man. He lived. He died. He lives again at the right hand of God. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. All men find their hope in him, and all hell finds their dread in him. Hallelujah. Friday, he's in the tomb. Friday and Saturday, Nissan 15 and 16. He's in the tomb. On Sunday, I don't know if I can contain myself. On Sunday, on Sunday, on Sunday, they went to find him. But he wasn't there. He wasn't there. He lives. He lives. He lives. He lives. My God, if you can't get excited about that, I don't know how to get... There's no other way to amp you up even more. You want something from God, you already got something from God. The greatest miracle that God ever did is he lives. He lives. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. He lives. He lives. He lives. He lives. They came to the grave to embalm the body as their custom was. To consecrate the body. And when they went there, they found the shroud of the turn wrapped up and folded neatly and as they wandered and searched for where the Messiah was suddenly to Mary Magdalene he appeared and he said to her Mary and she said sir tell us where you put the body so that we can go and retrieve it Again, Jesus said, Mary, Mary. And then the eyes of her understanding were opened. He said, go tell my apostles and Peter that I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. So they sent word to the apostles, and Peter and John ran to the grave. And when they got there, they saw the empty grave with the folded shroud and said, What do these things mean? And they went back. They went back to the other apostles. And while they were at supper, Jesus appeared alive alive he stayed with them for 40 days the apostles are not the only one that testify of it even Flavius Josephus a Jewish scribe not in the Bible writes that he saw Jesus alive after he was dead even the heathen know what most of us aren't sure we believe or not that he's alive. Let me offer you a moment of encouragement here before we go. This world doesn't want to know anything about Jesus. 
They want something tangible they can see. The scripture said it would be that way. Even one of his own apostles said, unless I see the nails in his hands and the piercing of his side, I'll not believe he's alive. So it's no small wonder when the rest of the world don't, when someone who walked with him won't. But that doesn't change us from the truth that he's still alive. And one week later, he appeared with the disciples and Thomas. And he told Thomas, he said, come look at me. Touch these piercings. And he did. And he said, my Lord and my God. And he said, Thomas, you believe because you've seen. Blessed is the man who doesn't see and believes anyways. Blessed is the man that doesn't see me and believes because he's a candidate for my spirit. See, he had to do this because it was expedient for the Holy Ghost to come to him so it could come to you. And all righteousness being fulfilled because you took his blood, because you entered into covenant with him, because the promises of God you believed and trusted, because of that, his spirit lives in you to this day. 2,000 years later, the promise then is the promise now. The Lord that died is the Lord that's alive. The same book that was written then is the same words that permeate now. And it will never change, no matter how much the world wants it to change. He walked with them for 40 days and was seen by 513 people for 40 days. Not just his people saw him, everybody saw him. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. And because of that, he left you some promises. Amen? He left a few things here on earth for you to enjoy. See, the Father created the world and all its beauty in the physical. But Jesus Christ, being born of the Spirit, creates in you the beautiful creation of God that is now you. His greatest joy, His greatest treasure, His greatest blessing are you who occupy these seats and take His name by faith. To the discernment of this world, you are blessed, all blessed above men on this earth by your faith in Jesus Christ. It may not seem like it. It may not act like it. You may not appear to be that person in your own mind, but it's not your mind that's thinking it. It's his mind that's thinking it. And while you might be rough around the edges and may have done some things and maybe not entered into the kingdom the way you wanted to, the fact of the matter is that you're here and your sins are buried in the deepest sea, never to be remembered again for you to live in any torment any longer about it. God loved you that much that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. In Matthew 28, verses 1, the Bible says, at the end of the Sabbath, they began to draw towards the first week of the day, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was as lightning and his clothing white as snow, and for fear of him the keepers did shake and became his dead man. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear ye not, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, he is risen. Come see the place where he lays. And another translation, he says, Why seek ye the living among the dead? Why seek you the living among the dead? He's not there. He lives in heaven at the right hand of the Father. There are promises of us that are abounded to us. When Christ died and was resurrected again, he gave uh, gifts to men and promises. Number one is his unquestionable love for you. The undeniably unquestionable love that God had for you. In John 3.16, we know the verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But there's more. In John 15.13, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man who will lay down his life for his friends. Can I submit to you, greater love is that someone would lay his, down, his life down for somebody that despises everything about him and does it anyways. That's demonstrated in Christ. In Romans 5, verses 7 and 8, the Bible says, For scarcely for a righteous man would one yet to die, yet preadventure for a good man one would even dare to die. But God commended his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us in our worst state, our most unlovable state, our uncleanliest state, our dirtiest, 
rankest part of us now has been saved by His great love. In Ephesians 3, 17 and 19, that 17 through 9, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, to you be filled with all of the fullness of God. In 1 John 4, 9 and 10, the Bible says, In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because He sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us first, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sin. Substitutionary atonement. Paying the price He didn't know, because you had a debt you couldn't pay. None of us has the righteousness to stand before God and to declare ourselves ready to go to heaven. Only through His blood, only through His sacrifice, only through His love uh, can we stand before the throne of God and be accepted into the kingdom of God. Only by that and this great love. Not that we initiated this love, but that love was initiated by God to us so that we can choose it. He chose us. He chose us. That's why the Bible says in John 15 and 17, Henceforth I call you no longer servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you my friends. All things I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and ordained you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he might do it. His unquestionable love. We forget that sometimes. Number two, his unquestionable love, our unquestionable love for each other. The scripture says, by this we know we've passed from death to life, that we love the brethren. By this we know we've passed from judgment into eternity, that we love the brethren. That would be you. Amen? Amen? Turn around and look in your neighbor's eyes real quick. And tell them that would be you. That would be you. Look at each other because this is what he's talking about. Not just the ones that you're comfortable with. Amen? Not just the male or the female or the black or the white or the brown. But guess what? There's all of it here. And guess what? You are all equal in the sight of God. There is no segregation in the church. There is no racism in the church. All who are take the name of Jesus Christ are all of the same flesh and of the same heart and of the same mind. And there are no divisions and schisms here. You must love each other unconditionally even if you don't always get along with everybody the same way. The scripture says in, in John 12, 34 and 35, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, so also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. Amen? In Ephesians 5, 2, the Bible says, And walk in love as Christ also loved us, and have given himself an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. And 1 John 2 Verses 9 and 11, he says, He that is in the light and hateth his brother is living in darkness even and now. He that loves his brother abides in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and knows not where he goes because his blindness has blinded his eyes. First John 3, verses 14 through 16, the Bible says, We know we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abides in death. Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because we lay down his life, because he laid down his life, so we ought to lay our lives down for each other. In 1 John 4, 7, the Bible says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. 1 John 4, 20 and 21, the Bible says, If a man say, I love God and hate his brother, he is a liar. For how can you love your brother whom you've not hate your brother whom you've not seen? How can you love God in whom you've not seen? And this commandment that we have from him, that he that loves God loves his brother also. Number three, there is an unfinished task on this earth that God has assigned to every single one of us. The scripture says in Matthew twenty four, fourteen. Of this, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. People say, why hasn't the end come? Because the gospel hasn't been preached to the world yet. It's all of our jobs to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
It's all of our jobs to reach out to those around us in love for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? All of our jobs. Why? Because he commissioned us to do it. Look at what the scripture says. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always into the end of the world. In Luke 16, or Mark 16, verses 15 through 17. Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. Never make the assumption in anywhere that you're ministering that everybody's saved. Amen, Walls. Never make the assumption that everybody's saved. Period. Preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. If you're not sure, preach it to your dog. Preach it to your goldfish. Preach it to something. Talk to somebody about the gospel and the world will be a better place. In Luke 24, 46 through 48, and it said to them, Jesus said to them, Thus it is written, and that it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in all nations, beginning here in Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. The gospel message of the cross is repentance and remission of sins through Jesus Christ. Our responsive reaction is to lay our sins at his altar, let them forgive him in repentance, and be removed by his blood. That's been the standard of this message since he was here on this earth. It hasn't changed then, and it doesn't change now. It doesn't matter if it's popular. It doesn't matter if it doesn't market well. It doesn't matter if it doesn't network well. That is the message to the lost souls that live in darkness on this earth. And again, the world hates it. 2 Timothy 2, verses 4, verses 2 and 5. It says, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine, but shall after their own lust heap themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall be turned away from the truth and unto fables. Why is there an unfinished task? Let me tell you what it means. As long as the mission fields cry out, unfinished. As long as the remote areas of the city cry out, unfinished. The wailing of the satisfied, unsatisfied soul cries, unfinished. The voices in darkness cry out, we're unfinished. The voices of the ones in bondage that cry, unfinished. The voices of the strongholds of addiction cry out, unfinished. The broken home cries out, unfinished. The broken spirit cries out, unfinished. Those in the country that live in darkness cry out unfinished. Those that live in the city cry out unfinished. The searching heart that hasn't found it cries unfinished. Why do we do what we do? Because there's still a large part of this planet that's crying out to God, I am lost and without hope. And it's our job to go get them and bring them to the house of God. You don't have to be a pulpit preacher to do it. You don't have to be a great evangelist with a great oratory. All you got to do is care about him. And he'll take you where you need to go or he'll bring them to you where you are. It has to matter. Frankly, in the last 10 years, the Christian faith has become very lazy with this. It's not a, just a pastor's job to do this. It is all of our jobs to do this. Sitting and doing nothing is nothing unto itself. There's only, let me tell you something, there's only one true way to fail at life, and that's to do nothing. Every strong person in the scriptures testifies of their human failures and frailties and sinful nature, but they still did it anyways because he was more important than failure. Amen? I'm sorry, I'm a competitive guy, I don't like failure. I have no intention of losing at this, and I suggest that you don't either. I'm as competitive an A-type personality when it comes to competition as anybody else is. I want to win, and I want to win going away, and I want to win gaining yardage. Amen? Doing nothing, zero times zero will always get zero every time. Every time. You can't change the math around. Zero times zero still equals zero. Now, please don't take out of context what I'm saying to you here. All you have to do is care enough about your family and your homes and where you are to make a difference to change this world. You know, if, if we would just 
minister to each other and minister to our families in love, then this message would get done a lot quicker. Because if you teach them to do that, then they will change. Amen? They will change. They will. Luke 19 and 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which lost. John 9 verse 4, I must work the work of him that sent me while it is day. When night comes, no man can work. Number four, the unmistakable plan he has for our lives. God has a plan for your life. Amen? Every one of you, it may not be the purpose you think it should be, but every one of you have purpose. Every single one of you can make a difference wherever you are. It doesn't matter where you are. Amen? You can make a difference. And lastly, his unshakable testimony. We are the witnesses of Jesus Christ on this earth. We are the witnesses of Jesus Christ on this earth. This is your message. This is our message. This is my message. This is every church's message that calls itself after the name of Jesus Christ. This is our message. Amen? It's his deliverance for us. The scripture says, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and we love not our lives to the death. It's a, it's a humble walk. It's a submissive walk. It's a walk that is determined to see itself to the end. It is a walk that is birthed in salvation and concluded with these words, well done, good, and faithful servant. It's not just the pulpit that's going to change this world. It's the changed hearts of every man in this room. And we have a job to do. All of us. And it's time to get busy. We have a job to do. And it's time to get busy. I don't care what it is. I don't care where it is. I don't care who it is. The days of slumber and rest are over. If you're new, I understand. But by and large, we've been in this a while. Amen? The reason you don't see many miracles on this earth is because you're not seeing the gospel preached much on this earth. And when the gospel comes back, then the miracles will come back. When the word of the Lord is preached, then the miracles will come back. The presence of the Lord will come back. Revival will come back. The hearts of men turn will bring revival. They will change all of your situation. And it will, it will usher in the presence, the favor, and the blessing of God. When we are faithful where we are, we'll be given more. But if we can't be faithful where we are, then even that which we have is going to be taken away from us. And like I said, I don't, I don't take losing real well. I expect more. If you are a blood-bought Christian and you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, operating in the miraculous, then you should expect more yourself. When you prayed that prayer for the baptism of the Holy Ghost and God filled you with His Spirit and given you that power, and if you're sitting on your anointing, then don't blame him for the lot in life you have. He wants to use you, especially if you have that gift. Now, everybody understands that gift. I get that. But if you do and you understand it and you have it, you are without excuse. We as a church have to go forward. We have to rise up. We have to go up. We have to be men and women of character and integrity and commitment and faith and honor and duty. And we owe nobody an apology for that. It's time to be men and women of character, pillars of this truth in a lost and dying world. As the enemy runs amok, what other alternative do the people have but to turn the world if we don't give them the message? What other alternative is there? Just more evil. And let me tell you something. There is a time now, during these holy days, that people genuinely want to know the reason for the hope that is in you by your example for them. They genuinely do want to know what it means. A lot of people don't, but a lot of people come to a place in life where they really want to know. 
there's a vacuum inside of them. There's a void inside of them. And they don't even understand it. There's a part of every human being that only God can fill. That empty void that lives in your heart or next to your heart. And you pursue everything from money to wealth to power to fame to addictions. You never come to the place of peace and satisfaction that you set off for on that journey in the first place. You never get there because you're filling your soul with the wrong things. And you wander, it's all over the place. I can tell you from working in a car dealership, it's all over the place. They wander and they wonder and they care what's going to happen to them when they die. And they want to know the truth. They want to know, is this all there is? Is this all there is for me? Am I just going to live a miserable existence and die and burn in hell? No, you don't have to do that. Because I know a guy. Anybody here know a guy? I don't know about you, but I know a guy. Amen? I know a guy. And he's not on a cross right now. His spirit lives in all of us. Don't take heart what I'm don't take the wrong way what I'm saying. If God has called you and God has sent you, God will equip you and he'll pay the bill along the way. He will go with you and he will help you and he will teach you and he will lead you that which he has purposed for your life. Whether it's a child, whether it's a home, whether it's a business, whether it's a ministry, wherever it is, no matter how bizarre it seems, it's his call. So you know, before I ever got an associate pastor position in this church, I'm the pastor of a Fortune 300 conglomerate. It was my first ministry. They still call me pastor. So you can pastor anywhere you want to and be anyone you want to in the name of Jesus to reach anyone that needs to be met. Amen? Try it. Ask yourself today for God on this high holy day. Ask him this morning. Would you stand with me? Can I ask, does anybody want to do, even if it's just something small, for the kingdom of God? Raise your hands if you want to do something for the kingdom of God. Just anything. Lord, just use me. Just use me. I don't, I, I'm not pulpit, I don't mean pulpit ministry. I don't mean the perception that successful ministry is. Amen? You may be called to witness to one person in your lifetime. One person. Let me give you an example in the book of Acts, chapter 9. One guy named Ananias fulfilled his God-given purpose by receiving the Apostle Paul by faith after he had an encounter with Jesus Christ, even though he was the tormentor of the entire Christian faith. God asked him one time to receive him, and the birth of the greatest voice of the Christian faith arguably, was birthed because of one silent, insignificant man's faithfulness to God. That's what I'm talking about here. If anything, be the one that lifts the minister and the minister's call up, and God will recognize you for your faithfulness no matter how insignificant it seems. God loves you, and God has purposed in his heart that there's a place and a purpose for you on this earth, and it's time to do it now. Now, you can leave here, or you can determine in your heart, I want to make a difference. I want to be a part of what Palm Sunday represents. I want to be a part. I want to be a part of this. Because we need all of you. All of you. Let me preface this altar call with this. Is there anybody within the sound of my voice that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior? Is there anybody within the sound, heads down, eyes closed, we're not here to judge. This is a holy moment, and I'm asking you to take a moment out of a Sunday that you have the rest of the day of to honor this moment where God speaks to his people in the decision-making process and not bail out of here. 
and I will get you out. I'm, st I'm still early. This is a holy moment. An altar call is a choice where life and death happens. It's the same as an operating table in a hospital. It is the same as a jury room in a courtroom. It is the same significant eternal decision that you made if you're saved. So please allow the courtesy of others to make that decision. Because the scripture says, if you will profess me before men, I will profess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. If you are not sure that if Jesus splits the eastern sky and calls us home, that you're ready to go meet him in the air, I would suggest that you come forward this morning and give your life to God or give it back to God. However you deem necessary, don't walk out of here and go into eternity without the assurance of knowing that if you left this morning, you don't know what would happen. Secondly, if you have not been baptized with the Spirit of God, for the power of God with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues, I encourage you to come down to this altar and receive the gift of Pentecost that Jesus Christ provided if you are already saved. Amen? If you're not saved, please don't do that. It is a subsequent work of the Spirit in conjunction with the regeneration of the soul. That's why we do the way we do. Lastly, if you want to serve, whether it's folding envelopes, making calls, doing emails, anything, anything that you have a gift at and you want God to anoint you in your gifting in life, then I'm asking you to come forward as well. Scripture says, I have a plan for your life. There are thoughts of good and not of evil. If you're doing a job in this church and you need encouragement, if you're struggling in your ministry in this church, I want you to come forward. If this has become overwhelming, I want you to come forward. We want you healthy, wealthy, and wise to the things of God. Amen? If you want a vision for your life as part of this church, I'm going to ask you to come forward. Amen? I want you, if you want God to do something in this church, I don't care if you're an elder, I don't care if this is your first week, if you want God and you want more of God in your life, this is the hour with which God is ready to pour himself out. This is the time. This is the place. You're the people. And if you don't come forward, I ask that you lift your hands towards these people and pray with us. Amen? Pray with us during this altar call that God will touch people's lives. Amen? This matters to them. It should matter to you. You matter to them. You need to matter. To, they need to matter to you. I'm asking for just a few minutes to pray. And I'm asking for just a few minutes to let me work with these folks, and then we'll shut her down. Amen? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, as decisions are made, I pray that each and every person within the sound of my voice, wait a minute, he's asking me, wait a minute, he's, if you can't come down to the altar because of a physical infirmity, and you want us to come pray with you, then raise your hand and someone will come pray right where you are. Amen? Just raise your hand and let me know. I need two ushers to scour the aisles and look at the people who need prayer that can't make it down here and go pray with them. Amen? Please. We, can, we got this up here. Amen? Let's touch some hearts this morning. Amen? Pray for these people. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hang on, Pastor, let me turn this off. All of my gains now fade away. Every crown no longer on this Kingdoms are
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Were you glad to be in the house of the Lord? We have one more act to go before we dismiss you. And that is, we need your help. And we need your help not only in your service, but we also need it in your temporal means and in your financial giving. As the ushers come before, we simply need your help to continue on. If God has touched you in this church, if God has blessed your life in this church, we are going to ask you to give a small portion of that blessing and that favor back to God so that he can continue to provide the favor and the blessing that has been consummate with a successful life. This money goes to the gospel of Jesus Christ for the advancement of his kingdom and the glorification of his name. We need God's touch financially. And we're asking you to consider in your heart that which you can do to make this church, make this vision, make this ministry the best it can be. We are asking you to participate in the end time harvest of Jesus Christ. There are kings and princes in the Bible. We need some kings to help, or kings and priests. There, we need your help to fund the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think that mantle is an honorable one, and I think that mantle is the one that demonstrates how much of God's love lives inside of you. We do not promote ourselves, but we simply ask you to help us do what God's called us to do here by the grace and the means with which he's already provided you to do it so that you can bless this house. Amen. Does anybody get anything out of this this morning? Did you enjoy this service? Then I'm asking you, as your senior associate pastor, to bless this church. Amen. And help make a difference so that we can reach souls. Amen. That's what we're here to do. This whole community still needs to hear the gospel. And it needs to hear it from us. So let's make that possible. Amen. Let me pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, as we go forth from this place, Father, and as we give, may the power of God fill this room one more time. And Father, in the name of Jesus, may your kingdom be the, the most important reason we do things. May your glory be the motivation for giving. May your name and the honor of it Consecrate our own hearts to love the lost and to capture the vision and ask you, what can I do to make a difference for the kingdom of God? In Jesus' name, amen. Ina mokoto sundara bo yandara bo koto sundara bo koti yandara bo koto sundara bo yato. Ika to soba bo koti yandara bo 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 Ina mokoto sundi andara bokoto rono. Ina sundara bokoto rono bokoti andara. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. It is my heart that as you leave this place, that you remember the significance of this day. They're called holy days for a reason. Every once in a while, God asks us to remember why we're here. And remember what was paid for our liberty. I pray that you touch somebody's life this week. And I pray that our pastor and his wife will be back at their rightful place as leadership of this church next week. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your faithfulness to come and hear me while I've been doing it. I want to thank each and every one of you for the help you've given me, for the support and the prayers you've offered me for the patience and endurance of dealing with me. And I just want you to know, from the least of you to the most of you, just how much I love you in my heart. Because in a time of adversity, you've responded. In a time where your own lives could be falling apart, you've been faithful to come to us and work with us and help us. 
And for that, I am grateful from the bottom of my heart. The fact that when times got tough, you didn't run away. One of the things that we've been through, you stayed with us. And I will be forever grateful to God and honored to call each and every one of you my brother and sister. Father, as we go, may this love of each other fill this sanctuary. And let us go forth on this day with the busyness of life on a Sunday and the beautiful weather out here. Let us be reminded that this holy day is a consecration of the heart. In Jesus' name, may you encourage and empower and strengthen and pour wisdom into those that hunger and thirst for righteousness in this life and in the lives of others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Oh, hang on.